Well, I want to speak for a few minutes on a passage from Psalm 121. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Bible, that's okay. There's one, a Bible in the rack in front of you. If you open that up right to the middle of the Bible, you'll find the Psalms, which is kind of a book written to help us learn how to pray. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 121, which is on page 516 in the Bible in the rack in front of you if you didn't bring your own. Now, sometimes when we get into a public gathering, we say, okay, everybody turn off your cell phones. We do not want you to turn off your cell phones here. We like cell phones because some of you have Bibles on your cell phone. So please pull those out. Psalm 121. Uh, you have an iPad? Great. Pull that out. Psalm 121. You know, I was thinking about these folks that are being baptized, and the Bible tells us that that is one of the first steps in an apprenticeship to Jesus. Jesus said, if you have discovered life in me, the first thing you should consider doing is being baptized. But it's just the first step. And we soon learn, as we begin this journey with Jesus, that life is not always easy. Have you learned that? In fact, uh, a lot of things get better. Uh, as we just heard in the stories here, uh, there's an initial feeling of relief in knowing our sins are forgiven and we've got a new start. But then as we do that daily walk, and Pastor Jason reminded us of this last weekend, we can enter into some distress. Life comes in. We live with people who lie to us. Sometimes we undergo slander. People put us down, gossip about us. We find it difficult. The psalmist said in Psalm 120 that he lived in the land of Kedar and Meshach, which I don't think he meant literally. I think he meant it as a metaphor of saying, I live among barbarians. <laughs> He's saying, I'm for peace, but the people with whom I live want violence. And so as we begin this ascent and the Psalms of Ascent from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 are all about uh, pilgrims going to Jerusalem for three yearly festivals to worship God. And as they walk up toward Jerusalem, they're using these psalms as a pattern for prayer. And so when we're in distress, where do we go? Well, that's Psalm 121. He's going to tell us that uh, we look for help, and where do we find help? Now, before I read this psalm, let me just acknowledge that oftentimes in our country, we think it is a sign of weakness to admit we need help, and especially that we might need help from God. A lot of people wonder, do we even need God? And, and of course, part of the reason we think this is because of the most famous Iowan of all time, John Wayne, born in Winterset. And John Wayne could over... Some of you are going, John Wayne, who's that? <laughs> um, Mr. Morrison, his real name, uh, born in Winterset, lived there three years and then moved somewhere else. But John Wayne could take on a lot of enemies and be victorious. And then, of course, there's Rambo. Who could say? He took on whole armies by himself, won great victories. And then there's my favorite, Dirty Harry, pulled out his 44 Magnum and uh, blew people away. I mean, he had a passion for law and order. Make my day. <laughs> well, you know, you kind of get the idea from Hollywood, you don't need anybody. You just do it yourself. Now, there's something that's helpful about that because we would admit that a lot of people are irresponsible and maybe overly dependent on the government or on relatives, you know, always seeking a handout. Okay, that happens, yeah. But we kind of grow up thinking we don't need God. We can kind of be self-reliant. So I'm coming to a psalm here where it says we need help. So I'd like you to look with me at this psalm. I want to read it. It's only eight stanzas long. And, and I'd love it if you'd stand with me. And uh, out of honor for the Word of God, <coughs> let me read this. This is the very Word of the Lord, Psalm 121. A song of ascents. 
I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is the name of the Lord. Blessed be his name. Thank you. You may be seated. Now what he's telling us here is that we need help and we need to go to the person, which is God, who is a powerful, present, and promised help. Our God is our help. And if you haven't discovered that you need help yet, you're going to discover it soon. No matter how self-reliant we think we are, inevitably we stand by the bedside of a child fighting for his life in the hospital. We get handed a pink slip that says our company is downsizing and your job will be phased out. We may be estranged from a brother or sister in the past year. We haven't talked with them, maybe 10 years, maybe 30 years. We may get cross-haired with our spouse and you may go to your husband and say, hey, look, we've got to get this worked out. Can we go to a counselor? And maybe your husband says, no, don't have any interest in seeing a counselor. We get into these situations and then we see how much help we need. But it's not easy to admit that we need help. The psalmist is wrestling with this just as we do. Where can I find help, and do I really need it? It used to be that the most favorite verse that people would quote out of the Bible was John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Nowadays, it's Matthew 7, judge not lest you be judged. But a lot of people said their favorite verse in the Bible was God helps those who help themselves, which is not in the Bible. You know who said it? Benjamin Franklin. God helps those who help themselves. Now, there's truth in that. God does help us and helps those who do take responsibility. But if we have the idea, as I think Benjamin Franklin did, that God just kind of wound the universe up like a clock and let it go, and that he just kind of steps back totally uninvolved in the universe, and that you've got to help yourself then, that would be the wrong idea. If we believe that we don't really need God, well, we're wrong. One of the favorite stories of the Second World War is Winston Churchill, who, as the Prime Minister of England, tried to galvanize the people in the British Empire to stand fast under the onslaught of Nazi bombers. They would come in and bomb the city of London and the the nation. And he gave a, a stirring speech one time where he said, never, never, never give up. And he he was trying to help the people of England to stand strong. But you know what it is about the heroes that we admire? They don't say they don't need help. They stir people, but then they know where to go to find the resources to help. And he knew, Winston Churchill, that he needed the help of the United States of America, which until Pearl Harbor was very reluctant to get involved. 71 years ago, yesterday, was D-Day, when the American forces gathered on the shores and went across the channel to fight on the shores of Normandy. He knew he needed the help of America. Do you need help? Do you know you need help? Because if you say, I don't need help, you're wrong. Let me give you an example. There was a pastor named Eugene who had a problem with his mower and decided to try to fix it by himself. This is a dangerous thing for pastors to do. You just don't tend to be mechanically inclined. 
And so he grabbed the wrench and began to try to loosen the bolt on the mower to fix it, and it wouldn't budge. And so he got a longer wrench, used greater leverage, and was bearing down on it, and it still wouldn't budge. I'm sure that at that moment, thoughts and words came to his mind that he dare not reuse. But he really got upset, really angry. Oh, I want to do this, and I can't. A neighbor showed up. Eugene, he said. I had a mower just like that, and if I remember it correctly, the instruction said that the threads go the other way. And Eugene said, when I pulled the other way, it came off like magic. And he said, you know what? I was glad to be proved wrong. Now, if you're here today and you think you can do it without God, you do life, may I humbly say, you're wrong, and I hope that like Eugene, by the end of this message, you'll go, oh, I am glad to be proved wrong. You see, the psalmist says, we need help. When times are tough, we need help. And it's prideful to think we don't. In Proverbs 16, 18, it says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I mean, even the Beatles knew they needed help. Help! I need somebody. (laughs) One of the greatest hits of all time. We need help. Counselors tell us that when a person is trying to overcome addictions, the first step is to admit they need help. So where do we find the help that is needed? If you can admit it, where do you find it? Jesus said in Matthew 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened. And so the psalmist said, I lifted up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Now, there have been many theories about what he saw when he looked up into the hills. Sometimes when we're going through difficult times, we think, oh, if I could just escape. Have you ever thought about that? Oh, if I could just quit my job and go to the Rockies and live independently. If I could escape, the psalmist said, if I could escape as a bird to the mountains. He could have been thinking about escaping. The problem of escaping is that you can't escape yourself. You take yourself with you wherever you go, and so that becomes a problem. But it could have been also he was looking for a spiritual help. Now we know in Bible days, Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 2 tells us that the Canaanites practiced their idol worship on the, on the hillsides in Palestine. And so maybe he looked up there and he saw those idols and some of that pernicious worship and he thought, boy, if I could just have some spirituality, I could get through this. It'd be like somebody today saying, oh, I need help. And you go over to Barnes Noble and you look at the self-help section or probably more popular, you just type it into Google. I need help here. And you're hoping that something pops up that will give you some guidance. Some alternative spirituality. Or it could have been that he looked up into the hills and thought, I've got to travel. This is called the traveling psalm. And as a traveler, I know that I'm going to be susceptible to bandits and thieves and robbers. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10? Here was a man traveling through the hills of Palestine, and he was beaten up and robbed. And the Good Samaritan came to to rescue him. Whatever it is, what he seems to be saying to us is that looking up into the hills is insufficient in finding the help we need. Because then he goes on to say, no, no. I can't escape, I can't quit my job, I can't self-medicate with alcohol, I can't obsessively check my phone for sports scores or uh, the latest Facebook posting. These provide but temporary relief. I need something else. Real help is in the Lord, he said, who made heaven and earth. Now that is a pregnant phrase. Notice that he says, my help is in the name of the Lord. And if you look at your Bibles, it's capitalized L-O-R-D. That is always a hint that it's the word Yahweh, or we might put vowels with it and say Jehovah. And it refers to God in the Old Testament as the covenant-keeping God, the God who keeps his promises, the God who watches over his people. He said, 
When I look for help, I look for somebody who will keep their promises. And that's God. And he says, and not only that, he is the maker of heaven and earth. So he's not only the covenant-keeping God, he's the creator God. And so when I get into these problems, I just find myself getting up in the morning and saying, Lord, so far the day is going well, but I've only been up five minutes. So Lord, I'm looking to you, the maker of heaven and earth, and I'm looking to you for help for this day. That's what he's saying here. I met with the, some high school students. What a privilege. Last Sunday evening. You know, uh, adults tend to be nice. High school students don't care about being nice. They, they're not afraid to ask questions. And hard ones. Adults, you know, we kind of skirt around it. But high school students, and I love that about them. They, they, they ask really tough questions. In fact, I was so uh, anxious going into this setting, I tried to lower their expectations by saying, I am not the Bible answer man. But I knew the tough questions would be coming. One of the questions that came to me was, can a person who is a Christian lose their salvation? That's a good question. I think a lot of us, and maybe most of us if we'd admit it, believe that we want to be followers of God, but sometimes we just fall short, we give in to some temptation, we do something we know is wrong, and then it comes back to haunt us, and we wonder whether we're even Christians. And so I said to these students, I've wrestled with this, and, and you know, in our church, we, we all agree on one thing, and that's we come into God's family by grace, by His undeserved love, by His mercy and grace, simply by faith. We just trust in Him. It's nothing we do. We just receive His grace. We all agree on that. But there's a variety of opinions among us. Some believe that if you fall away, you lose it. And others believe if you're truly in God's family, He will hold you to the end. But I said, here's where I've gone as I've wrestled with this. I've gone to John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30. In that passage... Jesus is speaking, and Jesus is saying to these people, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So he's saying to his followers, that's his sheep, My sheep hear me, I know them, and and they are in the palm of my hand. And then he goes on to say, My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So it's as as if he says, I'm holding you, and then in addition to that, the Father is holding you, and then he says, the Father and I are one. And I talked about how that passage has been so helpful to me in times when I've doubted, because I've I've fallen to some temptation or I made some stupid mistake and come back to haunt me, just to know that God isn't giving up on me. Talked about Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Talked about 1 John 5, where the gospel writer says, I write this to to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. We talked about that. Afterwards, I realized that all those statements about our assurance in God's holding us are related to Him being called Yahweh the covenant-keeping God, the maker of heaven and earth. Now let me ask you a question. Is that the God to whom you go for your help? Do you go to Him? What happens? We get into some trial or tribulation, and we get anxious, and we get so anxious And then we begin to feel guilty because we're anxious. Oh, I should be doing better than this, and I feel like I'm falling apart. And then we get frustrated. Why isn't somebody helping me? What's wrong with my wife? What's wrong with my husband? Why can't my kids be there when I need them? We get frustrated. Where's God? And then despair comes in when things don't change. It's a cycle. We all go through it. Now, what he's saying is if we look to the hills, we look to a spouse as well, as much as our spouse may love us, that man or that woman can never fill the God-shaped hole we have in our hearts. 
when we look to the hills for help in our spouse, they will inevitably fail to measure up. And if we obsess over our kids and demand them to meet our needs, they will eventually disappoint us. In fact, if we're that obsessive, they may run from us. And if we go to work, working day after day, night after night, trying to escape the problems of life, they will still be with us when we come home. No vacation can permanently relieve us of the stress of life. There's only one place we can find help. The covenant God, Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. You know, as often as we talk about that in this church, it's so easy to forget. In fact, about one hour after this service, I'll have completely forgotten the sermon myself. We want this to be a community of joy, to be inspired by who God is and what He's done for us. And we go out the door, and about Monday at noon, we're wondering if God even exists. We just forget. And so it's very interesting to me that when that psalmist goes from God is our uh, maker of heaven and earth, when he gets to verse 3, the person changes. Did you notice that? He said, where is my help? And then he gets to verse 3 and he says, you. He goes to the third person. Many people think he did that because he's saying, I'm so forgetful, I need to preach to myself what I just said about my help being in God. I need help to remind myself of it. Look with me. He says, the Lord is your guardian God. That's why you need to trust in Him. Because, verse 3 and 4, the Lord does not sleep on the job. He says, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps Israel, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He doesn't sleep. He's the one who helps us in our time of need. <laughs> if you uh, ever read through the Old Testament, you'll come to a book called First Kings, and you'll be introduced to a prophet named Elijah. And Elijah was one of the few prophets living in Israel because they were killing all the others. Because this idol worship called Baalism was predominant at that time. And one day they had a contest. And it was the prophets of Baal, which were 450, against Elijah. 450 to 1. And they're going to have a contest to see which idol, which god, could call down fire from heaven to consume an altar that had been constructed. And so Elijah, being the generous person he was, said to the prophets of Baal, you go first. And so they did. And they were cutting themselves and they were crying out to their god and nothing was happening. And the day continued on and finally Elijah began to mock them. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 27, Elijah said to these prophets, Cry louder, for he's a god. Either he's musing, you know, he's deep in meditation, or he's relieving himself, you know what that means. Or maybe he's on a trip. Or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. <laughs> I wonder if the psalmist was thinking about that story when he wrote these words. Now, as you know, the story goes on, and Elijah, finally, after they're unsuccessful, he pours water over his altar three times and prays, and God strikes that with fire, and it burns up the altar, showing who the true God really is. Well, the point is that our God does not sleep. Our God does not slumber. In fact, He is so watchful, He sees if our foot slips. What is He saying by that? What He's saying that when we look to our God, we realize that we have a God who gives us stability. If you've walked outside on an icy day in the winter, remember that happens in Iowa? I know it's been a long time ago when we had ice, but you walk across, oh, and you're really careful. Well, it says that God is so attentive to our needs, He sees us when our foot slips. 
Now, he's not literally speaking of our foot slipping. He's thinking of us spiritually speaking. He gives us security and a sense of stability. I love how it says it in Psalm 119, verse 169. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. He says in this, so preach this truth to yourself. He says, remind yourself that God is with you. He never sleeps. In Psalm 42, the psalmist is preaching to himself. He's thinking, I've got to remember who God is and preach it. He says, oh God, hear my cry. He says, why are you downcast, O my soul? He's saying, what's wrong with you, Randy? And why are you in turmoil? Hope in God, for again I will praise Him, my salvation and my God. We just need reminding. We need a daily reminder. This is why we encourage Bible reading in our church, because day after day we get up in the morning and say, oh God, I need to remember. What did you say again? And then we read the Scriptures, and He speaks to us and reminds us that He's with us and will never leave us or forsake us. You say, how can I know for sure that He's watching over me and help me? Well, He goes on to say, He who does not sleep oversees Israel. How much more if He oversees a whole nation will He oversee you as an individual? This whole aspect of God being our keeper means guarding, watching over, attending to us carefully. He is our guardian with our eyes open. You know, I, I meet with a group of guys on Tuesday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it's really early. And so the coffee pot is on, and we're drinking coffee, trying to become coherent enough to have an intelligent conversation. And one of the guys in the group, Chris, as he concluded our time in prayer last Tuesday, said, Lord, we're so grateful that you don't need caffeine to stay awake. <laughs> That's the kind of God we have. He's always awake. He never sleeps. He's always watching. If you read the Old Testament story of the children of Israel being in Egypt and suffering the misery of making bricks, in chapter 2 of Exodus, you see God says He remembered the people and He saw them in their misery. Oftentimes at the end of a service, we pronounce this benediction from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. What does that mean? The Lord's watching you, His face shining on you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and grant you peace. See, this is the God who sees us. He says God is powerful, the maker of heaven and earth. And God is present. He sees us. He watches us. He loves us. This is powerful truth. One of my sons had a problem because each night monsters would show up in his room. Really scared him. He'd cry out. I'd hear him. I'd go into his room. Monsters! I'd say, okay, let's turn on the light. And then we'd go into the closet and we'd look. No monsters there. And then we'd look under the bed. No monsters there. And so I'd say, well, Jesus is watching you. Yeah, but Jesus is invisible. <laughs> okay. I said, flip off the light. Let me watch over you. That's what our God says. I'm watching you. I care for you. I'm guarding you. I'm keeping you. I'm protecting you, he says in verses 5 and 6. His present help includes this protective aspect. And He protects us, not just by the week, but day and night. By the very second, God is walking with us. He uses some powerful imagery here of the Lord being the shade at our right hand. We can only imagine how... I've never been to Israel, but I've heard the sun bakes down. And you can imagine these pilgrims walking up to Jerusalem, the sun beating down on them. And God said, I am the shade at your right hand. And then the fear of walking through the night on their journey and the dangers of bandits and robbers. He literally uses the word moonstruck, sunstroke and moonstruck. Uh, you know what a lunatic is. It comes from the word lunar, moon, madness. And he's saying, day or night, God is with us to guard our ways, 
to protect us. Sometimes we wonder how we're going to get through a day. Time pressure creeps up on us. We have so much to do, and we forget that God is with us. And then we become anxious. I've got to do more and more with less and less time. And then we begin to feel guilty because we can't get it all done and people are depending on us. And then we get frustrated. Oh, if somebody would only help. And then we become despairing. I'll never get it all done. And we just need to preach again to ourselves. Ah, we have a God who whether day or night is with us, never leaving us or forsaking us. He walks with us as our shepherd each step of the way. Is that the God to whom you look for help? Or are you looking somewhere else? Finally, he says in verses 7 to 8, our God is not only powerful, maker of heaven and earth, and present help, but he promises to be with us and protect us from all evil. Look again at verses 7 to 8. The Lord will, and notice he changes to the future now, the Lord will keep you from some evil, all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and coming in from this time forth and forevermore. God is not only omnipotent, all-powerful, and omnipresent, always watching, but he shows future grace to guard us from evil. Now, I can hear somebody saying, ah, okay, at that point, I'm not sure I agree because I know of good people to whom bad things happen. How can God promise to protect us from all evil, but then I see evil being done to good people? Even to Christians. If 21 men lined up, Coptic Egyptian Christians and brutally massacred by Islamic terrorists. About a year after D Day, April 1945, a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer ended up in the Flossenburg prison camp in Germany. If you know the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know he was a Lutheran pastor who uh, was a strong proponent, follower of Jesus, and joined the resistance against the Nazis. And because of his association with some who tried to kill Hitler, he was arrested, spent time in prison in Berlin, and then the Buchenwald prison camp, and then in April 1945, ended up in Flossenburg. I was thinking of this because A friend of mine, a friend of our church, Jim Bowie, who now lives in Chemnitz, visited Flossenburg Prison Camp a couple of weeks ago and posted his thoughts and feelings as he walked through that prison camp, which exists even today. And he talked about the somber feeling that came over him as he saw the ovens and recognized the very place where Dietrich Bonhoeffer on April 9, 1945, died. So how do we view this? If here, here's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's trusting the God who says, I will guard you from all evil. And yet here we have the Nazis one month before the Allies set that prison camp free, hanging from a rope at the hands of the Nazis. Evil seems to have prevailed. How do we look at these things? Well, Here's how Christians look at these things. We look back to the early Christian historian named Tertullian who said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We believe that God, as Pastor Phil led us in this song, This is My Father's World, we believe that God reigns over this planet. And even in the midst of evil, even when someone dies, For the sake of the kingdom, good things can come. It's the seed of the church. It springs up. We we learned that as we saw a video a couple weeks ago of these Coptic Christians who died and the good that has come out of that. So we can't deny that evil exists, but we can suggest that in some way God oversees even evil 
to bring out his good purposes. We don't understand it, but we realize that some, there are some things worse than death, right? And you could say it's horribly evil to lose your life early, and yet Bonhoeffer had a win because he ended his life at 39 at the hands of the Nazis and has spent time since praising God in the presence of the company of angels. So for Christians, we realize that there's things that are worse than death. What God is promising here is that even in the midst of evil, God never promises to take us out of the storm, out of the difficulty. In fact, Psalm 23 says, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I what? Fear no evil. Why? You are with me. So God never promises to take us out of the storm. He promises to be with us and to guard us to the day He takes us home. Maybe I could explain it this way. It, this is hard to understand in light of the promises in Psalm 121, but my daughter was four years of age, years ago. The table was being cleaned because we were getting ready to end the meal with my aunt and uncle. And as a four-year-old, she gets up and takes off running and not much peripheral vision at that age and runs smack into someone carrying plates and cuts her cheek right below her eye. Oh, dear. And you know when you have a cut on your head, it bleeds and, oh, crazy thing. So somebody had to be elected to take her to the emergency room to have her stitched up. And guess who was elected? Dad. So I did. I did my duty. I took her down to Sioux Valley Hospital. We lived in Sioux Falls. And uh, took her into the emergency room. And the doctor said, oh, we'll take care of that. And he pulled out a syringe with an anesthetic. And I could see my daughter looking at the syringe. And her eyes are wide, and I'm realizing it's going to take me to help hold her down because she's deathly afraid of this evil that is coming at her. And what I learned is a four-year-old has a lot of strength. It took three adult men to hold this girl down. She was livid. And so the doctor came at her, and, you know, he's, they're trying to keep shield her eyes from seeing it, and she's looking around, and, and, I, and, I, and she's saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy! And I'm thinking, oh, sweetheart, you know, I'm to be your guardian, and here I am, and oh, you're going through this. How could you do this to me, Daddy? Put me through this evil. And then, I mean, if that wasn't bad enough to anesthetize it, with a, then, then he had to bring out the sewing needle, you know, and sew it up. Well, it was very traumatic for this four-year-old girl but I tried to explain to her the best I could that by having her go through this, though it seemed evil to her, was closing a wound that could become infected and was doing a little surgery that could keep her from having a scar on her face. And as a loving father, I was called to protect her even though it looked evil to her. The same thing in a larger way seems to us we see this evil around us. We don't see how any good could come from it. But we have a God who promises to protect us from all evil until that day when we see Him face to face. Isn't that worthy of a hallelujah? Thanks be to God for His care. Now I'm going to dismiss the baptism candidate here. Sharon, is Sharon gone already? She's already gone. Well, she left too early. No, it's okay. She's going to get ready to be baptized. So let me just say, uh, as these folks have been baptized, it's good to remind ourselves, isn't it, that this is a first step in an adventure of life that may have some difficult times. Uh, we may come up against days when we feel anxious and then guilty and then frustrated and despairing. But isn't it good to know that as we're following what the Lord told us to do, He said, Go and make disciples of Jesus, apprentices of Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're symbolizing their death, death to self, death to the things that have kept us from God. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, coming up, cleansed by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And then Jesus concludes it by this. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Wow. That's the kind of help I need, don't you? Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Psalm 121. And thank you, Lord, for the way you've worked in Sharon Brown's life, which is really an illustration of this great psalm. And bless her as she is baptized now. In Jesus' name, amen. A lot of people say you don't need help. Aren't, aren't you glad that uh, that can be proved wrong? My hope is that as you leave today, you will look to the only place to find true help, to the Lord, the covenant God, the maker of heaven and earth, who is our powerful help, who is our present help, and who is our promised help from all evil until we stand in His presence and sing Amazing Grace and a hundred thousand million other praise songs that will occupy us for the days to come. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and grant you His peace, now and forevermore. Thank you for coming. Take three minutes to find somebody you don't know and make a new friend. Get to know them. Let us, let's be the family of Jesus and minister to each other. Thank you. You're dismissed.